Welcome to Trash Arts Take. You I uh, love the immediately, immediately. <laughs> and cut. <laughs> Excellent start. <laughs> Let's try that one more time. Sounds like you remixed yourself then. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Trash House Take. I'm Sam, and I'm here with Jackson, and we're Hello. doing something a little bit different this time. So Ryan's not here. We're going to have one of our roundtable discussions about censorship, and in particular, looking at stification, the controversy, and uh, always going to be their politics of it all. We're joined by two filmmakers that we absolutely adore, who we've talked about a lot and actually interviewed from Horror on Sea. We have Tom Lee Ryer. How you doing, man? Hi, hi, hi. You good? Yeah, very well, thank you, Sam. How are you doing, Jackson? Nice to see you, yeah. you both. Yeah, good. Cheers, man. Nice to nice to talk to you. Awesome, awesome. And we Always also and we also have Michael Fausti. How are you doing, man? You good? Very well, thank you. Good to be uh, good to be in such distinguished company this evening. <laughs> I, <must say. laughs> I wouldn't call us that. <laughs> <laughs> I've got my smoking jacket on for the occasion. <laughs> I, thought, I thought you would have. It's only excuse for you, isn't it, Tom, to actually get this fucking jacket out. <laughs> we actually it's had... a pleasure to hear from you too, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> we actually received Exit today. We've got the beautiful Blu-ray, which you're currently selling at the moment, Fausti. And yeah, I'm happy. I'm, gonna, I'm looking forward to putting it in the collection. It's very lovely. What an absolutely beautiful set that is as well. Mm. So congratulations, Michael. That's, oh, it's, like, it's a banger. It's an absolute beaut. Thank you so much, guys, and thanks both of you for your, you know, support with the release. It's it's really been a, a big help, and it, it means a lot. And uh, such praise from such uh, filmmakers like yourselves really, uh, you know, really means a lot, guys. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, bless you. Bless you. More than welcome, man. Like I said, one of my favourite films of the year, easily. Right, so let's get big into the big into the chat. Let's just get into the chat. So we're going to start first by talking with censorship, and we're going to look at certification. Now. Because we are the West, we are going to look more towards uh, America and the UK. Also, we're the West, we're more repressed, so censorship seems to go hand in hand a little bit more. Um, Particularly with sex, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sex is going to come up a lot during this, and of course our good friend horror. Um, so we'll first talk about what we're in the UK, and in particular in the 1980s where Margaret Thatcher was in charge. And one particular woman kind of had a bit more of a moral stance than most with Mary Whitehouse. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah she really went after everything we were what we were doing a little bit of research today and we were looking at how obviously with the evil dead and the kind of responses from the tory backers who were supporting her there was one quote um which basically said like if 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 you think this is appropriate then you should be in the same world as me this is this will make this is bad for children and maybe even dogs <laughs> and it's like <laughs> what <laughs> I reckon her and Miss Woodhouse were one and the same. Yeah, you, you never saw them together, actually, if you think about it. No, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Walkies! <laughs> so, Michael, being a bit older than us, I don't mean that in a negative way, of course. Did, did you... Well, it sounds a bit negative, I must say. <laughs> did, did you have much of an experience with VHS nasties in the 80s? Yes, I did. And um, I was thinking about this this morning, actually. Um, there was kind of a news agent near where I lived. And they kind of just had a sort of couple of dubious shelves of, of videotapes. And I can distinctly remember going in there and seeing the cover for SS Experiment Camp there. And I can't have been more than about 11 or 12. And I think what a lot of people don't realise about those early days of um, VHS tapes is that the major studios didn't want to go near video because they really thought it was going to interfere with their kind of like licensing for TV and also their kind of like, you know, showings in cinema. So they thought it was going to kind of kill their income there. So kind of in step these independent distributors with a lot of sort of what were essentially movies made um, by Italian companies from the 70s. And, uh, you know, I do remember sort of pre-1984 sort of quite vividly seeing you know, some of these um, tapes and, and actually renting, you know, some of these titles and, and watching them. But it wasn't the kind of sort of streamlined business that um, sort of home media became. So you'd kind of, you know, they, they'd be there alongside the newspapers and the suites. And it was all, you know, it was all independent. There weren't sort of video shops as such initially. Again, they, you know, they were incredibly expensive for um, these small operations to buy. They were about like 800 quid for a tape which they then had to rent numerous times to make money back. And, of course, 
the more salacious a title, these little independents would go for it because they knew that they were going to get some return on their revenue. I mean, this is why a lot of the tape collectors want the ex-rental tapes because the actual tape stock is much, you know, of higher quality because it had to be watched over and over again. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. The, uh, yeah. the, you know, the sell-through videos that came afterwards, they're produced on much cheaper stock. You know, that would uh, degrade a bit quicker. So. Well, the the interesting thing about what you're saying there to me is that um, <clears throat> it's like it, 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 this new form of media comes along, this new form of distribution, and the studios don't like it, and so they they in some ways uh, stamp their foot down on it and try and stop it from getting bigger and getting more powerful. And we're seeing the same with VOD now. It's it's quite amazing how nothing really seems to change. Yeah, yeah. I mean. Uh you know, in some respects, the history of the internet is really, you know, the, the, the VHS tape again. You know, initially, nobody goes near it, and then kind of, sort of more questionable material sort of jumps straight in and kind of, like, embraces the new technology. Well, the funny thing with all this, this I mean, with the studios, um, is it's very similar to America. We learn about the certification, that before certification was in place, a lot of it was to do with, um, like, writers or actors or filmmakers wanting to almost unionize to go against studios who are obviously monopolizing and controlling everything in the 20s and 30s. And that gave, certification is a, is a good t tool to be able to control what content they think is going to make money. And if, you, if you're not the content they think is going to make money, you're going to be, you know, minimalized. It gives them something to hide behind, you know, that mm. morality of like, you know, uh, yeah. what about children seeing this? Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really, it's really like pernicious form of control um, trying to like uh, moralise at you isn't it <laughs> yeah I think it's funny because um, over here it was always about the violence uh, the sex they wouldn't care for mm. but in America it's the sex and not the violence mm. yeah it's it's it's, yeah. All, it, it's really weird because they both come from like let's be honest religious Christian perspectives of like yeah. morally indubious material but for some reason America's always more Being sexually repressed conservatives yeah yeah that's it and this is the thing when when it comes to the <laughs> <laughs> when it when it comes to the the um, uh, repression of like talking about violence and stuff, it always seems to be the stuff that shows violence in its truest horrific form, um, rather than you know the uh, the sort of bloodless violence of some of the mainstream movies. That that seems to be absolutely fine with them as long as you're not seeing the repercussion of that violence. They don't give a shit and. Uh, <laughs> It's it, it, it's a really backwards way of thinking to me. I mean, I, we mentioned The Evil Dead earlier, I mean, which is, you know, quite a bloody movie, you know, literally. But the intention of that film always seemed to me, it, it was comic. You know, it was quite <laughs> a bit fantastical, <laughs> wasn't it? Yeah, it was, it was a humorous movie in many respects that wasn't taking itself too seriously. And so much of the violence is cartoon. And, you know, all due respect, I love the movie, but you, you can see it is prosthetics. And I yeah. think even in kind of like, you know, the 80s, you could see that. And that was <laughs> now, I'm not sure fun the, of it. I'm not sure if the stigma behind that film was what drove the way I felt when I saw it. But I think what really affected me growing up was uh, the crudeness of a low-budget film and special effects. And yeah. their intentions was always to go shock and take things a little bit further. And I always found the cruder they were... Uh, the, the more disturbing they became for me. So <laughs> yes. Evil Dead 1 in particular, was I did find quite disturbing because I felt like we're in a boundless area now where the Indies can just, like like what Jackson said, they weren't kind of um, governed by any kind of uh, limit. So they were just thought, well, we just didn't know how far they would go, take it, you know, and that would really yeah. quite disturb you sometimes because you thought, well, you know, nothing's off the, off the cards here, you know, so... And I think it was something about the the illicit nature of a lot of those movies that you know, as, as Tom said, we you know we didn't know what to expect because particularly television at the time and films at the time were just so incredibly formulaic and you know still are that when you are sort of searching out these independent um, productions, you know there is that whole kind of Pandora's box thing of you know what are we going to release by mm. watching this? And it's funny because the Italians, on the other hand, they would look at the product that was coming out of America and they thought, well, we've just got to mimic that. But then what they did was created set pieces in films that are actually really maliciously nasty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they would set the precedent for what would pretty much keep the, get this video nasty thing uh, kind of going, really. I mean, when you look at some of the stuff from the Fulci films, in particular, like the 
the uh, the New York Ripper. I mean, even today, to have, compared to the day standard, that's nasty. Isn't it is. It? Yeah. Yes, no, it is. And you can kind of, you know, you can kind of see in a way the, the moral panic behind that. <laughs> <laughs> But the thing is, it just opened this big black hole where a lot of films just fell into that same kind of category, even though they were nowhere near that kind of vis- visceral, you know. So, well, I, I mean, I, anything that was... They like, weren't, but I mean, if you look at, like, some of Sam Peckinpah's movies, there was a high degree of misogyny in those films. Mm. And yet, you know, yeah. in some respects, these were being bankrolled by the major studios and showing in cinemas. And whilst Absolutely, you yeah, to, you're right. To, you know, run-ins with the, with the studios, in many respects, you know, just as misogynistic as some of these kind of Italian titles. Well, one of the things that really used to irk me was the fact that, again, it's, it's, it's that studio monopoly thing. It's Jaws. How the fuck that used to be a PG is just yeah, beyond that's me. Crazy. <laughs> I saw that in the cinema, and I think I must have been about seven or eight, and I went with my dad to see it, and still, the scene where that head comes out of the sort of bow of the (laughs) ship, you know, here I am, sort of, you know... And it was always that float, that, that severed leg of that child. It's like, <laughs> yes, I mean, this is a PG. A, such a and grim, grim Corman, movie. Yeah. Well, Corman, with his independent studio, made his knockoff, Piranha, which was nowhere near as kind of effective. And yet that was slapped with an 18 mm. over here. So what's the logic there? You know, it's because um, it's because of the independence, you know. They're, yeah. they're, I mean, Lloyd Kaufman goes on a lot about it in his book. All I need to know about filmmaking I learned from the Toxic Avenger. He talks about how Die Hard pretty much went unscathed, whereas they at Troma's War they just yes. cut the ribbons, you know. Yeah, I because mean they I, were t- treating them as though they were the black sheep, you know. <laughs> I mean, I, I think there always is something of a kind of economic imperative to this that you know, in some respects, the major studios and the corporations are closer to the sort of the lawgivers and the gatekeepers, and so therefore it's kind of a case. Well, we're all right, but you know these. This unruly mob down the bottom, we just don't know what they're going to do next. And, yeah. and also, there, there seems to be a kind of almost um, a moral high ground taken by the gatekeepers in terms of, well, it's all right for some people to watch this, but there are people out there who will watch this and be kind of influenced by it. And, and there is almost, the uh, yeah, there is an implication there in terms of, I think, sort of, you know, the kinds of people which they never actually articulate who they think are going to be kind of, you know, unduly influenced by things that they're seeing on screen but some people are actually going to be fine with this well that's the thing with the um with the rating system as well it seems to be less about um you know whether whether people under the age of 18 or under the whatever age are able to go and see a film and more about where you can get the marketing for that film given that age rating um where you can end up with distribution where you can end up um you know, just being able to get out there in in other in other forms, um, and so like it, it's kind of interesting how that uh, they use that sort of excuse of this is to stop you know young uh, children from seeing these things, but really it, it's just a way to keep a clamp down on the market, and uh, uh, it's funny how those two things play off each other. And also, I think, all right, in fairness, you know, the studios are paying for it, so they they do have a kind of say in this. But to sort of take a sort of fairly notorious example of Ken Russell's The Devils, you know, it was a film which um, the British censor really did kind of like, you know, there was a big back and forth between the director and the British censor. But Ken Russell himself said the worst cuts to that movie were in fact done by Warner Brothers themselves. They yeah. hacked two entire scenes out of the film. And it there was, was a lot of preempted cuts from studios themselves yes. before they even submitted anything to the censors with so many examples, you know. And, and I think they, they really just have one view, and they still do, on kind of like, you know, is this going to kind of affect um, essentially our kind of financial return on this? And that is probably, I think, the, the greatest censorship there is out there. Mm. Really, it's mm. coming from an economic standpoint, which can be dressed up as a moral standpoint. But really, it is all about, you know, we need to get as large a return on this as possible, and the lower the certificate you know, will ensure that. It's interesting you say well, that. Is, I mean, uh, Halloween 3 over here on video, I'm not sure about theatrical, but that um, was released with a 15 rating, but it was pre-cut by the studio before it even went to the rating. So I watched. I remember watching this from the video shop and uh, quite clearly recognising where something had been cut. And I'm thinking, well, what is the point in re- cutting something and giving it a 15? You know, surely that you made it for the 18. But again, like what Michael said, it's, it's because... Uh, they're aiming for that, though, because of the, the larger demographic. They could uh, 
be entertaining and getting whose money from. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's very interesting. Like if you look at the um, the American certification system, we watched a documentary, which is a brilliant documentary that gives a good insight into it from 2006 called This Film Is Not Yet Rated, which was actually funded by Netflix, which is interesting in itself. But essentially with the process, it's with the, there's like a secret group of parents who decide on what's wrong and what's not right. Uh, what's wrong and what's good in a film. And then after that, if you wish to appeal it, you go to a secret board of appeal group. And again, they're all unknown people. The documentary revealed who those people were and the appeal group that you need to appeal to get your film not an NC-17 are the studio heads. They just do not like to reveal who their identity is, but this yeah. documentary revealed who they were. Studio heads and a couple of clergymen. Yeah. <laughs> so you're completely <laughs> right, Michael. The off them. Ah! <laughs> It's just kind of crazy, isn't it? That, yeah, like, there might be a group of moral upstanding citizens to judge whether your film is right or not from their own subjective perspective. And then it goes to the studios nonetheless to go, well, will it make money? That's, at the end of the day, what really matters here. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Well, this is why, um, you know, you look at uh, Die Hard 1 compared to Die Hard 5 and why Die Hard 5 is practically a PG, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's an interesting point. Let's um, blood out, you know, <clears throat> Blood was obviously selling in the 80s, but it doesn't now, because <laughs> everything is... Well, I think we might be on the, the turnaround again now, where I think more violence is probably selling more. I think it's a... Blood, blood, is blood is back. Blood is back. Yeah, blood is... <laughs> it's this season's hottest colour, so if you've not got blood, you are really... <laughs> well, it's like, a constant I, wheel that keeps turning. I, I, I think, think that's the thing, that you know. the video on demand services sort of, like, uh, made the uh, made the age ratings redundant. Um, you know, you... They don't have as much power as they did because you don't have the same sort of way for them to distribute. And so it goes directly on online and you could, you know, who's going to be able to monitor that? Who's going to be able to control that? They've basically lost their power. And I think that it's an interesting yeah. time right now to see whether they're going to try and take that power back or whether, you know, non-censorship I mean, will win Netflix, out. You get like the flash of the rating in a corner for two seconds. And yeah. Yeah. That's literally all you got, you know. <laughs> But because they can make, they can listen to the fans or what people want, and they will make things to order from, give us what we want, uncut yeah. and whatnot, you know, and un untampered by the studios. Whereas everyone, you know, these other studios were trying to get uh, everyone to the cinema as as much as they could mm. by making them practically what kids' films, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, you think like a f taking a family to a cinema is it, it's you know a ticket for everyone isn't it whereas if you're just going to see it a couple of friends it's it's a bit of a different um you know there's less money yeah. to be made in that i think as well i think this is why like you can think of every um franchise that were at one point quite visceral like you know your alien films or your predator films and mm. just look how they've watered down over the years you know and yet it's not made more money it's just not worked. Every yeah. time they do it, no it's, one it likes the film. No, you're, you're absolutely right. It's, it's very backwards. <laughs> <laughs> very bizarre. Yeah. I mean, go back to the, uh, the BBFC thing. I mean, it's become part such part of the fabric now growing up when you kind of get these videos in and whatnot. It's actually become a point of nostalgia now. Of, um, there's this film called uh, Burial Ground. It's an Italian horror film. It's since been released like uncut. But back then, it was butchered that badly. It was it clocked in at an hour long. <laughs> <laughs> and now, I kind of go back and watch that version over the uncut version, just for a laugh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, you know, it's at one point, you know, they've censored the hell out of it, but I'm having fun with it now. So, <laughs> so cheers, guys. <laughs> it's interesting with the other side. When we, the other side, you've got violence, and then, of course, there's sex. And with sex with films, the, the subjectiveness of what can get an R rating to an NC-17 or a 15 to an 18 is insane. Obviously, as a society now, we're a lot more progressive. It's only a couple of last couple of years where you might get a gay film not going straight to an 18. But back in the day, it was like guaranteed or seeing a female receive pleasure and stuff. And it's always, it's just this real murky line of what they consider to be abnormal behavior sexually wise. And their oppressive Whether attitudes. Whether James Furman was asleep or not whilst watching the film, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the, the ratings board. <laughs> it's just, because they, they have to write down the whole entire scene so they'll be like, the penis went in more than three times. There was four humps in this particular sequence. they got to write all these details down and then be like, 
it has to be this certification for this. And it's like it's crazy. I don't I mean, know if you saw the um, the campaign someone made someone made the once on Kickstarter where they submitted um, hours and hours and hours of paint drying to the BBFC. Like, <laughs> They had to watch the whole lot of it in case there was a spliced penis in there somewhere. You know? <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> well, it's, it's quite. They gave him a good day of work, you know. It's it's quite amazing with that, like the, the the level of writing down every single the number of thrusts in a sex scene. That's yeah. more perverted to me than making the scene. I think it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, really it's like odd. The stabs, you know. The, the amount of times you read the, the negotiations between filmmaker, between studio, between censor, mm. where they negotiate the amount of stabs <laughs> in a in a in a kill, you know, and but, uh, they would come back and forth and say they'd, they'd allow me five stabs even though I wanted ten. <laughs> they're like quite, trying to meet in the middle with seven, but no, they they would be down to five. And it's literally that particular, you know, it's that kind of particular, yeah. But it's say, it's you know. such a, a kind of reductive way of looking at filmmaking. Mm. It's it's kind of almost a, because they they do have a, a form in front of them. The the I don't know if we call them censors, but certainly the people who are looking at these movies in terms of what they're looking for. And I think it's such a kind of sort of simplistic bean counting way of looking at a movie. Mm. Um, I mean, they are supposed to consider things like sort of context and motivation of characters, but ultimately, you know, you wonder if you just get to a point, you know, as Tom says, that you're just sort of keeping an eye out for a penis here or a kind of gunshot <laughs> wound there, and you're just, you know, ticking it off and kind of going, yeah, there's too many, well, we'll give it this. Mm. And it does make you wonder these days, I mean, you know, um, are they actually, because we've all, we, you know, like, like what Jackson's saying about the, the age of streaming now and whatnot, we've, and the way that we're a bit more lenient with what we're allowing through the uh, through the gate and whatnot. Is, it, does anything get cut these days? And if so, I mean, what are we talking? You know, what what kind of content gets cut these days? You know, it's a funny one, isn't it? Because we look like um, when we make films as independent filmmakers, we know that there are obviously much more extreme content out there that will never get a mainstream release, but we'll still have some sort of release almost under their control. Like, if you think of um, the kind of Italian extreme horror from Tetro film with Donziano stuff, it's still being distributed, you can still get access to it, or the old um, Svod films from the 90s, they're still available. And it's like, the amount of um, legit releases that don't actually end up on the shop shelves, so if they're on Amazon and whatnot, that doesn't require a certificate, surely. Yeah, it's it's, it's a very confusing line at the moment. I think they they probably are struggling in many senses with the whole paying to get your film rated situation because if yeah. anything people like filmmakers like to call it a badge of honor of legitimacy you know and it, it is a damn cool thing to get but it's grown more and more obsolete now mm. to the point where it's like, yeah. well, why should we pay this much money to get it's an insane rating? amount we can just as well it over the internet you know. <laughs> <laughs> And I do think that's a prerequisite for the likes of Amazon, you know, because Amazon sell all the imports as well anyway. So. Yeah. yeah, that's true. And and so many of these uh, uh, VOD sites that, like, you know, they require people to upload things like Amazon itself has done and um, YouTube, for example, which, you know, again, has its own ways of uh, limiting content and restricting things depending on what's, what's in mm. it. But uh, they're just more direct about the fact that it's monetization and advertising that, that is the reason. Well, even going back yeah. to um, what Kaufman went through recently, where Troma's channel was removed on YouTube because they'd, you know, got a bit too close to the line of what's right and what's not on YouTube, and it's just annoying. Which is absolutely wrong. Yeah, because they've always had a political, co- like a, a moral compass, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But then that that kind of happened around the same time as they got got all these weird accusations from the alt right. <laughs> Trump supporters, yeah. wasn't it? That, that you know, everyone was suddenly calling them paedophiles for no reason whatsoever. Well, this is and the that, other uh, that seemed to spark that even more for some reason. This is the other side I wanted well, to look at with when it comes to um, censorship, is that obviously they go hand in hand with politics and who's in charge at that moment yeah. and how they want to use that artistic film to reaffirm whatever agenda they want to throw. I mean, the closest we had was when Cameron wanted to clamp down on porn. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Well, did you, um, do you remember um, Crash, the David Cronenberg film? Yes. Right, yeah. I yeah, remember yeah. studying this in film studies, so I'm sorry if it's not the full information. <laughs> essentially, that was used. The Daily Mail wanted to really use how the fact that a Labour doctor, because it's like 97, so just was Labour going in, to make it seem like, well, if the Labour Party are in charge, you're going to get more films like this that are offensive to sit- disabled people and... <laughs> It crashes banned in some places in the UK, which is absolutely insane. And it's politics can easily play that game, and they always do. 
I mean, also the thing about Crash um, was some London boroughs banned it and some didn't. So, mm. you know, you couldn't see it in Westminster, but you could go and <laughs> see it on the tube. Yeah, so, you, <laughs> so, I mean, I think this is, you know, in some respects, getting back to what we're saying about, um, you know, digital technology as well. The, the act of trying to ban something really is a fairly futile one. Um, in terms of the, the, the kind of the internet and stuff like that. But then in some respects, you know, you're, you are often kind of wondering if the sheer act of sort of censoring Sunny is actually just making it that much more attractive and interesting. Yeah. I think I mean, it is because it always took more money off myself because I'd always yeah. take out the uncut version later and that'd be more money <laughs> yeah. out of my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> that's the funny thing, isn't it? Because when you're talking about horror, you're right. It does entice you to go, oh, that's bad. I need to watch it. But when you're talking yeah. about an indie drama like that, like uh, the boys, boys don't cry um, by Kimberly Pierce, yeah. her film was heavily cut because she had like um, a woman going down with another woman, and just all these little scenes that she thought, well, how's that fair? When at the same time you had American Pie out, which you know was yeah. masturbating on pies, and there's <laughs> always more extreme sexual allowance when it comes to men getting their rocks off. But yes. when a woman does it, it's like, whoa, we got to put an 18 on that. We don't want to be encouraging that. Well, yeah, yeah. And that comes from such a weird place to me. Yeah. I don't understand yeah. why that that is part of the moral authority in the in the world. But you know, that's... again, it's, 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 it ties into the politics of the people who usually are offended. No offense to any uh, conservatives or Republicans out there, but it tends to be you guys, and that's what <laughs> really. Sorry. Actually, no. Some offense. Some definitely. Some, some offense. Some. <laughs> like. That's what's confusing about recent years with censorship and stuff, where there has been a more of a flip side where some censorship has come down to more of the a leftist perspective. And, that, and that's kind of strange. And um, one particular film I want to talk about in regards to this, and again, I've not seen this film. I just, we just, you can't not talk about the controversy of it right now. Uh, Cuties, the French film that's been recently released. This film has caused quite a big controversial discussion because to me it's like, oh, is it probably like kids or, you know, something by Larry Clark or one of those Sexualizing children, that's the angle, isn't it? Yeah. I think. yeah, but of course when it was approached from the film festival, it was, you know, them trying to critique sexualization of children and what's happened recently politically is that the alt-right have used the mechanisms of the vulnerability of um, children protection and used it to attack an art house French film by a, a first-time black filmmaker. It seems, you know, it's a little bit of a fine line. Yeah, I think it's... It, the thing is, is that the people that want to have these kind of things banned will find any um, moral outrage they can mm. possibly have in the, yeah, you know... Nine, when they yeah, look, when you look back at the old... Ten, you'll find that they haven't actually seen the content either. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when you look back at the sort of even the, the slashes back in the day, um, the number of times they called them misogynistic when actually they were enjoyed by a majority female yeah. audience... Um, and it was kind of about overcoming misogyny to a certain extent, fighting back against a, a often male uh, aggressor. Um, and yet it was always just that they just pick up whatever moral argument that they think might convince enough people at the time and just throw it at, mm. throw it out. And um, yeah. there's no there's no consistency with it. No, not at all. Oh, we've gone. We've, we're in a little quiet moment there. We're all thinking about <laughs> what. <laughs> well, uh, I'd like to just say, obviously, there's been a big clamp down about uh, leftist comedy as well. You know, yeah, and, mm. and a sense of a leftist view of. But um, in, from my perspective, I mean, where are all these right <laughs> comedians? Yeah, yeah. And right-leaning entertainment. Uh, I mean. Uh, the guy that made Naked Gun, he made a, a really conservative, like Republican-oriented film called a, An American Carol, where Kelsey Grammer, who is obviously Republican, it's like a, you know, it's like a, it's just a very pro-Republican uh, comedy, which <laughs> bombed, and it was terrible, and everyone hated it. Well, don't... David Zucker was, would say afterwards, oh, I'm done making conservative comedies, because, you know... They shouldn't. They just don't exist. You know, they no. don't. They yeah. shouldn't exist because it doesn't work if they do. Well, that's the thing. I think. So like... where are all these examples of decent, you know, <laughs> right leaning comedy? Well, I think with comedy particularly, like you're laughing, you, you've got to be laughing at someone above you, at like a power structure of some kind. You have to be sort of ridiculing the way that society yeah. is. And and so it, it doesn't really fit with a, with a political agenda like that. I mean, you know, you well, can they, argue yeah, that that's... Can't, 
see how ridiculous they are. You yeah, know, it's yeah. All laughing about the ridiculous. You know, there. <laughs> also, I think um, many sort of people who are coming at it from this perspective, their their political beliefs or their belief systems are all about maintaining the status quo. Yeah. Whereas, kind of sort of artists, filmmakers, comedians, they're all about pushing the boundaries and mm. trying to up things and you know sort of turn over the apple cart. And I think really it's. It is one of those sort of, sort of circles that is quite difficult to square because it's almost sort of two opposing forces in the, you know, art is always consistently pushing the boundaries and pushing against authority. And authority in turn is always going to push back and it's, yeah. it's almost like a never-ending scene. And they always use morality. It's always about corruption of innocence. That's the main focus yeah. because they know that that's always going to be a vulnerable issue, especially people who've got kids and have a, you know... A faint moral line if they think because they're religious or because they're following what they think the, the leader or conservative party or whatever is telling them is the right thing. It's very easy to use and it's used so effectively um, with, with art house kind of films and horror and exploitation films, especially with exploitation films. One of the things that people seem to always mi miss with films like The House on the Left or even The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, they're reactionary films to what was happening at that time and in particular with those films it was the Vietnam War. So you're going to get more of an aggressive stamp to be like, yeah. no, this is bad. And I think that's the whole, with exploitation films, it's usually about looking at the situation of how those people have been exploited and wrapping it into like a genre pick rather than just going, here's a film where we exploited people. I think that's the thing as well. Like they, they, they always find it um, uh, too much to deal with when, when you've got a disturbing scene or a dis disturbing moment. Mm. But sometimes that's the point of the scene is to disturb the audience. You're not making it because it's supposed to be celebrated or enjoyed necessarily you, you, you're trying to confront people with realities and and it seems really really yeah. stupid to try and put that sort of like oh that means that the filmmaker thinks this or, yeah. or you know likes whatever violence um it's it's bizarre i mean i was so I you know, as well, that there is a kind of degree of, it depends where you are in the food chain. So if you're mm. down at the exploitation end of, of the film sort of scene, then you're going to be coming in for way more criticism than Ingmar Bergman did when he made The Virgin Spring, which yeah, is basically yeah, yeah. what Last House on the Left is. Yeah. And I think yeah. if you're kind of European and Ingmar Bergman, then no one's actually going to say anything. But I think if you're seen as sort of slightly trashy and at the exploitation end, then I think a lot of fingers get wagged. No, I completely agree. I think we're in an age now where I think uh, we do need to uh, try and upset both sides of the coin as much as we can, really. <laughs> <laughs> upset uh, everyone. There's more, there's more of a, we're in a very uh, we're in we're in a big minefield of identity politics now, you know, and yeah. um, which means a lot of censorship doesn't always come from the right, you know. So it's true. Yeah. You yeah. Know, we're, we've got to uh, obviously um, address those. Um, points as well in the fact that you know it's uh <laughs> it's, it's really difficult to not offend you know we're yeah. to do something about offending somebody you know yeah, yeah. and um obviously i'm not gonna uh, make any kind of examples but um <laughs> there was a, there's a lot of splintered off kind of subcultures now and you know um it's very hard to kind of you know, guide your way through it all without upsetting somebody. So, but this is the thing. Is just, just I, I think in regards to this, like my my opinion of it is that like cancel culture doesn't really exist in the way that people sort of uh, uh, pretend it does. It's not the outcry of censorship so much as people just saying, "Oh, I'm not gonna." go and watch this or I'm not going to go and do this and then the studio freaks out because they're getting a lot of backlash and people you I think know, you're right. I think are being heard for the time first time on, on Twitter and Facebook and stuff and, and so yeah. like you know the studios do just get itchy feet and go oh no we, we can't do that um, yeah I think it's the same kind of sensationalism that you read when someone wants to ban poppies <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But all of a sudden, it set off this tremor through the the Z guys, you know, and uh, it 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 still does make you want to just make a film that is so morally ambiguous. You just want to upset everybody, you know? <laughs> <laughs> as indeed we do. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a weird sense when you do think of your own work and you you get your response from your horror community around you. And you're like, oh, they really like this, and then if someone outside who maybe doesn't have so much of a thin line when it comes to cinematically morality of what you can show. They do react in quite an extreme way and it gives you this horrible reminder of going, oh shit, it's not, you know, 
everyone's not as like liberal, chilled out as everyone else, you know. <laughs> well, I think that's no, the I thing mean, we're is we're all inconsistent. At the end of the day, we all contradict ourselves mm, many yeah. times throughout our lives, and yeah. it's all about um, it's about celebrating that. It's not celebrating a one-track mind or a one-track um, uh, outlook, you know, because it just simply doesn't exist. Yeah, and and in terms of art films, you um you know you don't expect necessarily a mainstream audience to be able to understand it or to um or to you know really get on board with it. Um, and I think that's sometimes where the where the problem can lie is that you know an audience that is not aware of of other kinds of art house films suddenly sees an art house film yeah. and it's like how can that be allowed? That's and it's so shocking to them. It's so yeah. outside of their. Um, comfort zone of what they've seen before that they just don't know how to deal with it um, and I think that's where sometimes that outrage like machine comes from mm. and I genuinely hope I find myself in a position where people think that about one of my films <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Absolutely. Want Everyone wants the headline, Daily Mail, ban this filth. Everybody wants that. Oh, absolutely. Oh, I mean, aim for the Sunday sport, you know. I mean, that's what you want. <laughs> the scummiest possible, you know. <laughs> it's funny, actually. Um, the, the last thing I wanted to talk about before we wrap it up is, um, yeah, our own personal experience with censorship. Now, with the films that we've made, um, well, Lonely Hearts was quite controversial. <laughs> um, that was banned in certain places and we couldn't release it and, and that was cool that's fine and Deep Web uh, XXX was banned I think in about 15 countries um, on a more personal experience though of like you know being hearing more about the directness of it we had a short film called uh, Bleed For Me which I did for Robert Litsky's horror anthology I Am An Addict and the film had to be screened to our local council because it was going to get a local screening, and rather than certification, the local council got to judge it for some reason. <laughs> uh, That's strange. It yeah. is strange. And the film, well, the, basically, the film got us an 18 certificate because of the short film that I'd included, because it had some, it was a lot to do with blood and um, vampirism, uh, a bit of self harm. I think I. It was Sexualizing all of that as yeah. well, yeah. <laughs> Female sexualization as well. So when that was screened, um, the Tory a person in our city was very much against it and felt that it was disgusting and offensive. They, they and wanted it to be cut from the whole yeah. anthology. <laughs> Which, of course, is not their decision. Are you not honoured? <laughs> yeah, because the Labour were the ones who backed us. So at that time, last year, that was like, that's great. <laughs> and it's a weird thing, but have you guys ever experienced anything similar to perhaps even something you've done or something you were part of or something you wanted to do and just censorship right in the way? It's a good question, but not on not on any scale of it being becoming a, a minor sensation, you know. But mm. uh, you've got me thinking there. <laughs> we we in in Kidderminster, it's such a small town that you know we had the local library with a gallery space, and um, and uh, our friend Baz, who makes films, Baz Ancho, he he makes films of the somewhat more extreme end of the, the stick. You know? <laughs> but uh, we'd be going to these library and. Uh, you know, we'd, we'd be showing his films uncut and, you know, for the first time, because let's face it, it was probably, it was looking like it'd be the only screen in the film would get anyway, because um, it's, it's nothing that a film festival would entertain because of the more extreme content. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and uh, we, uh, we we screened the film and uh, and then at the, at the afterwards we, we had a guy outside saying he wanted to kill himself. Whoa. And... Um, and then one of the viewers who was there for the night, uh, she, she kind of saw him kind of just repeating to himself, I, just, I want to kill myself. And I, I tried to talk him down, saying, look, man, you don't want to do that. It's not a good idea. You know, you, you just really need to just have a chill. And, and then this woman thought he was at the screening, so she went crazy at me. <laughs> <laughs> Wagging his finger like, how dare you filmmakers, you know, just... <laughs> You know, show all these horrible, horrific films where people are killing themselves and you can't even be asked to help this gentleman here. And, and wow. I said, he was not at the screening, you know, he, he wasn't there. Oh, was he not? No. <laughs> Fair enough, carry on. Yeah, exactly. And then <laughs> the guy came over to him and was like, you're all right, love it. She went, get away from me. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> yeah, oh. she was like, get away from me because he was just some, some pisshead who uh, was just trying it on with... Uh, <laughs> but no, nothing in the way of censorship, no, but I can just see how easily that could have escalated into mm. some sort of public yeah. outrage, you know. I mean, kind of similar to, to 
what Tom's saying, we've never really had any kind of sort of direct censorship or attempts to sort of censorship what we produce. But when you watch, um, you know, one of your films with a with a live audience, and you then start to see people looking sideways at each other, you know, during some of the scenes, <laughs> you actually come to realise that you almost exist in this little sort of creative bubble in which you've been more bothered about the editing and the sound levels, but you've actually completely forgotten the sort of mm. power of some of the imagery that is there on the uh-huh. screen, because yeah. for you it's become almost a purely sort of technical exercise to kind of get it finished and to a standard that you're happy with. But sort of in, in some respects, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a thrill to actually sort of see people's sort of reactions, you know, albeit even if they are negative, to sort of some of the uh, sort of more extreme. Well, I'm not going to lie, with, with Baz's film, Leon's Broken Mind, I mean, I said to him, look, we're screening it uncut, this is how it's going to go, because, you know, I'm not going to censor in any way. And then it came to the actual screening, and I'm watching these scenes, and I'm at the back, and my face is just kind of, you know, <laughs> disappearing into me. <laughs> <laughs> Can't believe we actually made it. We actually did it. You know, we were screening this on cut, and everyone's just sat there in stone cold silence. You could cut the tension with a knife. You know? <laughs> but it was worth it. <laughs> I think that's um, that's kind of like the beautiful thing with with the indie horror scene in particular. And I'm going back to horror on sea, but the kind of films that you expect to um, kind of screen and stuff, you really don't. You never go into it going, oh, I wonder if this is going to be too like too much nudity or too much violence or stuff. Because the indie horror community just likes horror. And they like to see a reaction. Yeah. And they like to discuss it afterwards. And the best kind of yeah. art is the what the art where you're all discussing it afterwards. And you might even have an argument where you're defending it, and other people are morally outraged by what they've seen, or just furiously angry because it didn't make narrative sense. <laughs> and, and that's what you want from film. And I think censorship will always fight us against that. But at the same time, we're independent filmmakers, and we actually have kind of more freedom because there is no studios. We just get to create what we want to do and see what reactions we get. And I think what's kind of interesting is when it comes to sort of censorship, you know, no one's censoring theatre anymore. Theatre hasn't been censored since 1968, mm. and no one's really censoring the printed word anymore. But film no. is still under the microscope, which means it's still powerful. Yeah. It's still mm. powerful enough to upset people in authority, then therefore it's still worth doing. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, though. Absolutely. I think that's a beautiful place to end our conversation. That is the last word, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we've we've had uh, Tom Lee Rutter and we've had Michael Fausti. Check out Carney Films and check out Fausti Films. You'll find their social media links and all that, perhaps at the bottom of the screen if I remember to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us. And yes, if you could like, subscribe and... Uh, What's the other one that he says? Like, subscribe, and write a comment if you've enjoyed what we've discussed. <laughs> I've been uh, Sam. Jack's been Jack. Jackson. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, if everyone wants to say goodbye to whatever what is listening, bye bye. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Nice bye-bye. talking to you guys. Bye bye. <laughs>